Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Our guest today is Gerald Salente, founder of the Trends Research Institute. He has been forecasting trends since 1980, and Gerald's motto is, think for yourself. He observes and analyzes the current events, forming future trends for what they are, not for the way he wants them to be. And Gerald is also the publisher of the internationally distributed quarterly Trends Journal. And we're delighted to have him here today as our guest. Good day, Gerald, and welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I'm in Colonial Kingston, New York. Wow. We're about 90 miles north of New York City. <clears throat> and this was the first capital of New York State. And we had the most historic four corners in America here. The only place with pre-revolutionary war stone buildings on each corner. So I love being here because the seeds of democracy were sown here. They're long oh. gone, but the plant is still there. Long gone? How so? Oh, it's, it's a militarized state. It's a whole different uh, place. America was involved in wars all over the world and the police state, you can't go out without them watching you or listening to you. So it's a whole very different place from when I grew up as a kid. I'm sure it is. We're, we're going to get into that in, in a bit. But um, Gerald, if, if you could, uh, could you share with us a little on how you got into forecasting trends? I mean, was there a moment of epiphany that led you down this path? Yes, there was, actually. Mm. I was the chief government affairs specialist for the chemical industry back in the 70s. And I was living between Chicago and Washington, D.C. And the Iranian crisis broke out. Mm. And Jimmy Carter was president at the time and went to spend New Year's Eve with the Shah and his wife. And he came back and he announced to the American people that the Shah was the island of stability in the Middle East. We used to have a line in, uh, in the Bronx where I was born, grew up part of my life. You say bullshit has its own sound. And that's all that was. And I heard it loud and clear. And at that point, I became a political atheist. I knew about how the United States, the CIA and the MI6 in the UK overthrew the democratically elected government of Mossadegh in Iran in 1953 mm -hmm. and the brutal dictatorship of the Shah. And when the revolution began and millions of people were out in the streets, I said, this thing is real. This is going to go down. But the American people didn't believe it. And then I thought, so I became a political atheist at that time. I no longer believed in the political system. And then I thought to myself, what will be the implications of this current event? What will be the future trends? And I was a young guy then. And I started speculating in the gold and oil markets. I started playing the futures markets. And I parlayed a $5,000 bet into almost three quarters of a million dollars back then. Wow. I lost a lot of it as I was playing the game, but that's how I began. I realized that current events form future trends. And if you look at things for the way they are and not the way you want them to be, mm. you could pretty much see the direction where things are going. But it's also what I call our trademark global nomic view. And that's making connections between different fields. Opportunity misses those who view the world through the eyes of their profession, I say. So economists, for example, they'll look primarily at economic data. They won't look at geopolitics, socioeconomics, and all the interrelated trends that affect other things. So we look at over 300 different trend categories, always making connections between different fields. So that's the, sh the long and short of how I got started in it. No, I, I like that uh, that five thousand dollar investment. That's that's pretty good. But um, you, you founded the the Trends uh, Research Institute back in nineteen eighty, and you've been forecasting trends ever since. And um, nineteen eighty happened to be the first top in gold prices uh, after the closing of the gold window by Nixon back in seventy one. Um, was your decision to start the Trends Research Institute related to that gold bull market as you, you touched on back in 1980? 
Well, yes, that's what I said. I started playing the gold markets back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I made enough money to quit my job. And so that's how gold helped me. And I've been buying gold since. So, um, you know, life has its ups and downs. Yeah. And gold has always been there for me. You know, if I needed to borrow money, I go to friends, I say, listen, I need some dough, you know. But I had a lot of gold. So what I would do is I say, listen, I'll give you the gold. You hold the gold and I'll pay you back in two years. If I don't pay you back in two years, you keep the gold and yeah. I'll pay you the difference if the price goes down. So because I got, you know, there's one of my books. There's a picture right back there of my aunt Zizi, Z-I-Z-I. -Z -I. Yes. That's the Neapolitan dialect for auntie. And um, and I got blackballed from a lot of the media when I said what would happen with the Iraq war and the Afghan war. I used to be on Oprah, the Today Show, Good Morning, everybody. But when there's pro-war, they don't want you talking out against what might go the other way. So, you know, as I said, life has its ups and downs. But I was able to borrow money by, by using gold as collateral. And I got it all back. But all my friends said, oh, damn it, I wish to... <laughs> Damn, I wish you didn't pay me back because the price went way up, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so gold has been, it, to, to the long and short of it, 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 I was able to quit my job as a government affairs specialist mm. and start my own business. And so that's how gold helped me. Well, going back to uh, 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 Nixon again, um, I've been asking some guests on, on recent shows if they remember their their uh, reaction to President Nixon closing the, the gold window back in 71. I think you were probably about in, in your 20s at that time. But um, what were you doing then? And what do you remember about, probably more so, what do you remember about your reaction to President Nixon's taking the U.S. off the gold standard? Well, you're right. I was a young guy then. At that time, I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. So I, I've had an inside view of, of politics. And there's a picture of me, I don't know if you could see it to the right, to my right, you know, of, of me and President Nixon, uh, you know, before he was president, 1976. Wow. Uh, he was the speaker at my group. So I, I've been on, in, the, in the circle, but I was too young to really understand what it meant, but I knew what they were doing. And so it, it, it you know, it was a learning process. And as a young guy, you know, I said, why are they doing this? And I re well, I knew why, actually, because the Vietnam War yeah. broke America's budget. And then nobody talks about that. And um, matter of fact, uh, last time I was in Singapore was in 1996. Hmm. And I went to Vietnam. They just allowed Americans to go there. And we were among the first Americans that went there in, the, in 1996. And so uh, the Vietnam War broke America's budget. And people don't remember that. They have no idea about it. And what they did, the, the, um, the Johnson administration, they started building all these social programs to yeah. quiet the people down and the anti-war protests. So the taking us off the, um, the gold standard in, um, in 1971 was a way for the United States to maintain its policy of printing all the money that they want and not losing the, um, the, the value of, 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 uh, of the dollar. And then in 1973, uh, Kissinger went to, under Nixon, Kissinger went to uh, Saudi Arabia and said, so, listen, here's the deal. We'll protect you guys. But what you have to do is um, sell your oil in dollar based petrodollars. Yeah. And that was the deal. So we'll we'll protect you guys. You the gang, the Saudi gang that was created in 1934. So those are the kinds of things that stabilize the dollar. Yeah. Do you think um People in the U.S. even know the term petrodollar or the history of it? Oh, no, they have no idea. Okay. I, I mean, I, I've been curious about that also. I, I've never known about it till maybe five, six, seven years ago also, but it's something that you don't commonly hear in the U.S. 
No, no, people don't have any idea what's going on in this country. The news is so dumbed down. They just talk about moronic stuff. So people have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I mean, you take the whole thing with Saudi Arabia and the, the killing of the journalist. Out of the news completely is about the, um, the, the war in Yemen. As we're mm -hmm. speaking, yeah. Saudis just killed about 30 people in an in a, uh, open market. And it uh, doesn't make the news at all. So people have no idea what's going on. Going back to uh, 1980, um, gold never regained that, that top that it had back in, in 1980. All through the rest of the 80s and the 90s, kind of stayed between 300 to 475 an ounce. Um, 90s basically went sideways all the way up until 2000. And um, some people describe this period as the time when gold was most unloved. And do you recall what the prevailing trend was during the 80s and 90s that caused gold to go sideways for such a long time? You know, you have to understand that, you know, trends are born, they grow, they mature, reach old age and die. You know, the, the, the gold run, you know, late 70s and early 80s, it, it was, you know, there weren't a lot of people playing it. You know, I remember when I first started playing the futures market, it was hard for me to find people to, you know, brokerage firms that knew how to do it. You know, so it was new. And then, you know, then there was a focus on the economy and the growth of the economy. So gold wasn't very popular and, and it, it, it wasn't really resonating in the people's minds. Like for example, if you go on to the CNBC site today mm -hmm. and you'll see, you know, they'll have the markets, they'll have currencies, they'll have gold and, they didn't have that before. Newspapers weren't reporting on gold prices. The media wasn't, the business media wasn't, was not reporting on gold. It was something that only, you know, people that were out of their minds and didn't know what was going on were investing in. They would make it sound like you were stupid. And, and after the 80s and 90s, 2000, we, we saw an increase. Uh, gold started to rise. What was the catalyst for the start of that bull market? Well, the, the catalyst was the, um, the beginning of the big uh, speculative real estate boom and the, the derivatives and the, uh, the leverage buyouts and the, um, the mortgages that you didn't need any kind of collateral for. They were giving you know, these um, low rate mortgages, uh, uh, giving mortgages to people without any credit, subprime mortgages. So it was the big ballooning of speculation. So the people that saw this as we did, and in 2002, we, we had forecasts, it's in our Trends Journal magazine, the beginning of the gold bull run. Because the people that were aware of what was going on knew that they were building a big speculative bubble. And so we knew it was going to pop. And that was the beginning. And that's why you saw a lot of people starting to get into it that knew the, you know, you saw what happened with all the banks and right. all the, the, uh, the debt load that was being built falsely on a fake economy. So that's why it started to rise in, in the early 2000s. Okay, I mean, um, I think it's it's pretty well known that um, we do have a lot more debt than we did back then. Um, do you, despite the lower gold prices, do you think that this higher debt and lower gold prices? Do you think it, it, it's probably a, a good time to start accumulating gold? I don't give financial advice. We're trend forecasters. Hmm. We had put the bottom several months ago at gold at around twelve hundred dollars an ounce. It hit 11.85, so basically $1,200 an ounce. Yeah. And of course, now it's in the, um, the 1220 range. So we believe that gold is now near its bottom. Our forecast over the last five years has been the same. Gold has to break over 1450 an ounce for it to gain real strength. Yeah. When it breaks over that and solidifies above that price, we see it spiking to above 2,000 an ounce. What would be the reason for, for the spike? Well, the reason for the spike will be, it, it's two, two issues. One, of course, is um, a global market meltdown. And we have just issued on September 18th of this year, 
watch out for an oncoming economic 9-11. I mean, you're over there in Asia. Take a look at the MSCI uh, Asia Pacific Index. You're in bear territory. Take a look at the Emerging Market Index. Bear territory. Look what's going on in the States with the equity markets. We're the only market really ahead of the game. And we just had a 600-point sell-off yeah. uh, recently. So you're, you're looking now at the NASDAQ touching correction territory down almost 10%. We, call, we were the first magazine, the Trends Journal, to call the Trump rally back in 2016. And now we were the first magazine to call the Trump rally correction in 2018. And now we're saying beware of an economic 9-11 where you're going to see global economies go down and equity markets. So gold is the ultimate safe haven asset, has been and will be in the foreseeable future. So that's why we're saying that we see it to the 1450 mark at some point. And then there are other issues like destabilization in the Middle East. What's going to happen when the embargo on Iranian oil hits on November 5th. Yeah, it's coming up. How are the oil market's going to react to that? If oil markets spike, if you see crude oil going above $100 a barrel, kiss the equity markets and global economy goodbye. Look back, back to the last five recessions. They were preceded, all of them, by rising oil. And then you, again, you look at the Asian stocks, and what have they lost? $5 trillion dollars just yeah. this year with no end in sight. So that's when gold becomes the safe haven commodity. Okay. Yeah, the, the thing with, with gold, um, investment concept of, of buy low, sell high, it, it sounds easy to do, but somehow we, we never get it right as investors. And we tend to look back and say, we should have bought here, we should have sold there, we should have bought here. Um, but in your opinion, why do people more often than not uh, we do the opposite. We chase a rapidly rising market, go over the top, hold through the bear market, and then we end up selling in despair. Well, I buy and hold. I, I mentioned to you I used to trade gold, mm. and I mentioned I made almost you know three quarters of a million dollars, and I ended up losing most of it. You know, so I don't trade. I just buy and hold. Yeah. And what I tell you know again, I don't give financial advice. You know, when when uh, I talk to younger people and I just tell them, you know, just keep buying it, put it away. And when yeah. you get to near retirement age and you have all this stockpile, you'll be able to have something whose value will always be there. It won't be like buying Sears stock or or uh, or other companies that at one time were very big and then gone away because yeah. of the changing times. So that's what I look at gold as. I don't look at that as a speculative investment. I look at that as a long-term investment. Again, I do not give investment advice. I'm only speaking for myself. Sure, I understand. Um, but let's say uh, gold, as Jim Rickards likes to say, hits five or 10,000 an ounce. Are we still holding or, or do we sell some at that point, given the, the strength up? of the you dollars know, still the same? What, what I suggest to people, for example, What's going on with the equity markets? And people say, so I own Apple stock. And, you know, I got a load of it. And what should I do with, the, with this turbulence? I said, what would be the price that you would like to have it at, that you would dream of? And what would be the sell price that you say to yourself, listen, I made enough money, I'm getting out as the price is crashing. And that's the way I would do the same with gold. Okay. What's the number that you would love? And what's the number that you would hate? I, I'm all for holding holding it myself. I, I don't uh, think it's a good time to give any of it up. But um, with the enormous debt that the U has, the U.S. has right now, uh, do you think that at some point there there may be a chance of any type of gold confiscation, like they had back in '33, if the government tries to dig its way back out of debt? Well, we began, began the conversation with you about where I live and how this place has changed and turned into a police state. They'll steal anything they want from you. They'll do anything they want to you. 
So of course they will. They'll do anything. They'll, they'll take anything they need. And uh, so, of course, that's why, you know, one of my lines is when, you know, all, when everything goes bad, uh, have a guns gold and a getaway plan. And that's when cool. I suggest to people, I wouldn't put it in the bank. I wouldn't put it in a safety deposit box. You know, they'll close the banks, a bank holiday. Isn't that a nice word, a bank holiday? Yeah. A holiday, you can't get your damn money out. You can't go into your safety deposit box. What holiday? It's a holdup. They're mm. robbing you of your dough. You got it? So that's what I'm saying. You know, take it on your own. People say, where should I put it? Put it anywhere you want. You know, don't, I'm not, don't ask me where to put it. Use your head. And uh, so... That's what I'm saying, but I wouldn't put it in a bank. Yeah, I hear you. But I mean, would it be possibly good, be a good idea to maybe um, keep what you need with you and, and maybe keep some of it out of U.S. jurisdictions or in a more favorable jurisdiction just in case? Again, it's up to people to make those decisions. I don't, yeah. you know, that's beyond, it's beyond my realm. But if you, you know, it's like having two passports. If all else fails and you got to leave, do you want to go somewhere else? Could you have another out? So, yes, you know, in those kind of thinking, if you're thinking like that, of course. Because how are you going to get it out of the country? They'll confiscate it. Yeah. Okay. Gerald, if, if you were Jay Paul right now, would you be raising interest rates? Yeah, I would in the sense that um, the, the low interest rates have only juiced the equity markets. Uh, they haven't, when you look at the data since 19, excuse, excuse me, since 2009, mm. uh, 95% of the wealth created in America went to the 1%. Yeah. 90% of the stocks are held by only 10% of the people. And they have on average about $360,000 worth of shares. So only the rich are benefiting from the low interest rates. And the low interest rates are a war against savers. Because the average person used to put money in the bank or buy CDs and get interest rate return on it. Yeah. They're not getting that anymore. So it, I, I, yeah, these, are, these are abnormal. I mean, we just heard the, from the ECB on, uh, on Friday, uh, excuse me, on, on Thursday, and uh, they're not raising interest rates. They're still in negative territory. Japan, yeah. negative territory. I mean, you know, it, it's uh, they didn't teach you about negative and zero interest rate policy and quantitative easing in economics 101 or in graduate school. They're making this crap room? up. So yeah. they're just what they're doing is they're feeding the market with cheap money. So, yes, I think you need to be as destabilization. When I look back to 2008 panic, they should have just let it fail. And let it rebuild itself naturally rather than artificially boosting it up. And they need to raise interest rates as well because when the next crash happens, they've got to go down on interest rates. So yeah. what, what are they going to do in the EU and Japan already in negative territory? They can't go lower. And even the United States, they're raising interest rates. Big deal. What are we at? 2 to 2.25 uh, federal fund rate, overnight rate? That's nothing. So how much lower are they going to go? How much? So they can't raise rates and sustain the markets. So that's what they're caught in that trap. And I believe that Trump is going to put enough pressure on the Federal Reserve not to raise rates. And this has been done before. We just heard from Paul Volcker, the former head mm. of the central banksters under Reagan, who just came out with a book and is quoted as saying that Jim Baker, who was Reagan's top guy, the chief of staff, went over to, to uh, Volcker and told him, you have orders from the president not to raise rates before Election Day. Yeah. So that's the deal. So I believe there's going to be a slowdown in the raising of rates. And of course, that'll be good for gold, because the stronger the dollar gets, the weaker gold goes. I mentioned petrodollars based in dollars, gold, mm. and commodities. Many commodities are dollar-based, too. So the stronger the dollar gets, the harder it is for currencies that are going down and people living in those countries, like India, where you're yeah. seeing the rupee at a 
all-time low against the dollar, gold prices are very high for them as their currency goes lower. Right. Same thing with China, as you're looking at the decline of the yuan. So the big purchases of gold in countries where their currencies are going down have more difficulty buying it. So the weaker the dollar gets, the better it is for gold. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, but there, there are some uh, those who believe that um, if the rates keep rising, maybe even just one more time this year, interest rates rise, uh, there's a good chance that the two-year and the ten-year bond will um, invert, and they'll be or we'll be looking at recession after that. Do Do you think that's that's possible? Yes, it is possible. Uh, there, there's a it, it, again this this whole equity markets, the whole economies have been built up on. On with with cheap money, and it's bigger than the United States. Yes. As I mentioned, what do you, you lost you know, five trillion dollars over there in the in the in the Asian uh, stocks, and you have um, all the emerging markets are in are in bear territory. Look what's going on in China. You talk about the United States debt load. Look at theirs. They got a debt to GDP ratio of three hundred, over thirty <laughs> trillion dollars in debt, more than ten trillion dollars more than the United States. And then you mm. look at the total debt. Globally, we're talking about $250 trillion. So the debt bomb is about to explode. Yeah. And when will that happen? It depends on what the central banks do to keep the Ponzi scheme going. And we're already seeing in China, with the Shanghai index uh, it, it going into negative, into a bear territory, down over 30% this year, uh, with the national team, the uh, plunge protection team version in China, what they do in the United States when the markets goes down, propping the Shanghai index up. So there, there's a lot of manipulative ways that the governments can keep the Ponzi scheme going. Yeah. You know, uh, Gerald, if if I were to look at a publication of, of, of your magazine, uh, Trends Journal, 10 years from now, would I see a publication where Trends predicted that the U.S. ended up being a, a socialist nation? No, not at all. It's a fascist nation. <laughs> but, no, by definition. Yeah. I mentioned what was going on after the Panic of 08. They bailed out the banks, too big to fail. Yeah. You've heard that, correct? Yep. Well, so what's that? That's the merger of state and corporate powers. That Mussolini, a guy who knew a thing or two about fascism, called fascism, the merger of state and corporate powers. Corporations run this country. It's not, a, it's not a democracy. It's not socialism. It's fascism. The money's all going to the top. The multinationals own the country. And um, you're going to see more and more of that. So it's not socialism at all. Very far from it. Yeah. Okay. A um, little bit of current events. What do you what do you see a week before the election, three days out before the election, given the, the these bomb scares that we have, given the migrants coming up? It's it's hard to tell. You know, it's again, you just talked about the bomb scares. You know, I always tell people you cannot predict the future. Mm. There are too many wild cards, whether they're by Mother Nature or man made. You know, look what's going on over there in Europe now in Germany. The Rhine River, where you can walk in it knee deep. You can't get barges with petrol and coal going up to, to drop the stuff off. So that's Mother Nature. And you mentioned the little the bomb scares going on now in the United States, man made. So you can't predict the future. You can see where the trends are going, and you can forecast the likelihood of what's going to happen. I mentioned before about negative interest rates and quantitative easing. Right. Tracking trends is an understanding of where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. So the, the how we got here, they never did that before. So I was wrong in forecasting that the markets would go down after the panic of 08 and 2009, 2010. I thought they would collapse more. I had no idea that they would do these kind of things because they were never done before. Yeah. So that's where the limitations are. So going back to see what's going to happen before the midterm elections, anything goes. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, uh, are we at the darkest hour before the dawn? No. 
It's up to the people to make the change. And, and I find that there's very little, very little drive to make that happen. We launched Occupy Peace. You go to the website, mm-hmm. OccupyPeace.com. I mentioned most four, historic four corners in America. That's where we launched it from. Had Ralph Nader, Cindy Sheehan, who just launched uh, a march, women's march in Washington against the Pentagon uh, last week or two weeks ago. And hardly anybody showed up. They black out the news when you want to talk about peace. So you don't have the drive right now for people to make it happen in this country. It's happening in Italy with the Five Star Movement, Cinque Stella and Lega League, where they're fighting against Brussels and warming up against Russia. But not in this country. There's no fight. You hear on the, the propagandist from the Bloods and the Crips that people like to call the Democrats and Republicans, the murders and thieves. Make sure you go out and vote in the midterm elections. Make sure you go out and vote for the midterm elections. For what? Which group of murderers, which group of thieves? By their deeds shall know them. They steal our money and kill people around the world. And same club, just different club members, Bloods and the Crips. So it won't change until people change. And it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men, said Samuel Adams, mm. a guy who knew a thing or two about a revolution. And that's what it's going to take to happen. Yeah, let's hope the, the revolution is, is for the positive. But um, I'll tell you what, hanging well, on to... I, I hope yeah. so. I hope so. Well, hope, I, hope, is the, hope is the most negative word in the metaphysical dictionary. <laughs> it means wanting something to happen without doing anything to make it happen. Hope. Could you let our listeners know more about the, the Trends Research Institute and, and how they can get started with the Trends Journal? Yes, they could go to trendsjournal.com, trendsjournal.com to see our magazine, the Trends Journal. It's the only magazine in the world where you'll read history before it happens. Mm-hmm. Money back guarantee. Of course, our major website is trendsresearch.com, trendsresearch.com. And if you want to donate to Occupy Peace, you could go to OccupyPeace.com, OccupyPeace.com, because the only way that the world will thrive is in an atmosphere of liberty, love, joy, and beauty, not war and fear, terror, and hate. So we believe that now is a wonderful time to have a real peace movement going on and redirect the energies in nation after nation into rebuilding the economies rather than building up a war machine. Yeah, those are some uh, calming, thoughtful words, Gerald. Appreciate it. Almost like uh, Aunt Zizi's quote, don't save all your money for a rainy day because you might end up spending it all on rain. Spend some on sunshine, enjoy your life. Gerald Salente, we we thank you for coming on the show, and uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, and um, we hope we can do this again sometime. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for all that you do, and good luck to you, Patrick. Good luck to you also. Thank you, Gerald. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Take care. That was Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal. For more of his insights on gold and the global economy, please visit his website, trendsresearch.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content.